What's happened is um, we've paved uh, 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 the roads to Kona, Taos, uh, Sedona with, uh, you know, junk, cultural wastelands. They're office parks, strip malls, vacant strip malls, super centers. And we've spent a lot of time and we've spent a, a lot of money and a lot of resources to create these cultural wastelands. And these cultural wastelands have their whole wealth of social issues that come with them. There's uh, health issues, obesity rates. Um, we're here in Scripps, um, it, uh, uh, probably a basis for global uh, warming and, and climate change. And uh, we need to, uh, in order to make, repurpose these places and make them work, we need to figure out the, the, the issues of redevelopment. And we know redevelopment has its own cultural issues as well. Um, the governor has plans to raid redevelopment coffers. Um, the uh, born from 60s urban renewal. Most uh, cities have already self related redevelopment to uh, only commercial or industrial areas because for fear of the public backlash of redeveloping their land. Um, and uh, 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 condemnation is, is part of the issue, but it's key to allowing us to, re to grow and, re and, and then generate tax revenues, which keeps uh, the lights on, keeps, uh, uh, paves potholes, and it keeps uh, uh, pension plans funded. And this whole placelessness and, and, and fear and angst of new development has really freaked a lot of people out. Um, how we communicate is, uh, with each other has suffered for it. Um, I'd like to, I'm reading notes too here, just so you know that I'm, um, I'm, I'm, I'm cheating. I'm not looking at my wife the whole time because she's so nice. Uh, but what's happened is, uh, in places that are really nice, such as here in La Jolla, people will fear redevelopment for its uh, fearing that it'll uh, lower property values. And where there's a no there there, people will fear that redevelopment will give the next developer more than what they have. And um, can you blame them? I mean, uh, let's be honest, cities are broke, redevelopment is unpredictable. Um, and despite Einstein's definition of insanity, we continue to use the same suburban planning tools over and over again, expecting urban, different urban results. And these same municipalities have separated our place-making uh, ability. Uh, roads are now built by public works. General services build civic buildings. Parks and rec build civic spaces. And with um, the demise of planning departments, now code enforcement is planning for a future. Um, no. the, um, the idea that uh, the, the biggest point of contention with re new redevelopment and uh, new development is the issue of community character. And community character is uh, a problem. Um, I remember reading an American Planning Association book that said, uh, trying to define community character is a bit like trying to define pornography. Uh, while it's very difficult to describe, you know it when you see it. And we know great places that have that that have great character. My, my wonderful wife and I will spend um, thousands of dollars and days of travel just to soak in the character of a place like Paris, um, South Beach in Miami. Can you all see? How about that? Uh, the French Quarter in New Orleans. From these images, you can almost smell, taste the, that sense of place, the character of it, and how wonderful these places are. And yet, we don't always get it right, or it's not easy to get right. Um, this place actually has all the characteristics you want of smart growth. It's mixed use. It has shopping, fine dining. There's, there's uh, high density housing, all at a transit station. But in fairness, this place was built to, to, to accommodate for the quantity of automobiles and a quantity of goods. And it loses that quality of the human experience. Um, I have another quote, and this is true. Uh, we need new tools, we need new urban design techniques to plan for that quality. Um, because um, in, in San Diego, if you propose a new development, the um, first thing that we talk about, or the only thing we focus on is what's the density? What's the quantity of the people that are there? How much housing are you going to have? Well, how do you begin to define community character as you go? Uh, last year, Leon Creer came to San Diego and talked about uh, the architecture of community. 
And uh, Leon says that uh, uh, neighborhoods, uh, the basis of the neighborhoods are there's a public realm and a private realm. And the, the public realm is consisted of the foreground buildings, uh, churches, town halls, plazas, civic spaces. And the, and the private realm is the background of shops, houses, uh, of, of offices. And then these are interdependent on each other. And this neighborhood is where we have all the places and the people that we need to fulfill our, our daily needs, our daily lives. So very important places. Then Leon showed us that the neighborhood has an urban pattern. And that urban pattern either uh, organic or informal. He uses the word vernacular, which means a local language. So there's an informal uh, character, uh, or there's a formal character, which is a classical character. Whoops, sorry, I have to go back. I apologize for that. Which is classical, or you have a mix of it. Up here, this English village is an organic pattern. The American grid in the middle is a formal classical order. And uh, Madrid's Plaza Mayor is a great example of formal foreground with an informal background. And these are how you make uh, the patterns of a community. And then architecture follows the same sort of rules. You can have informal architecture that's organic, formal architecture that's classical, or a combination of both. Now, the heights, the building types, the materials, the color, those help make up the character, but essentially these are, 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 the, are, the, are the factors that make up uh, place. San Diego has a tremendous classical uh, um, precedent. Uh, Balboa Park was built 100 years ago on purpose to do this, a formal classical architecture on a formal classical urban pattern with courts and plazas and uh, uh, paseos. Then just up the road, you have this wonderful, organic, uh, informal architecture on this tremendous, uh, on this uh, formal plaza. And both of these places are just powerful places that were done by great architects. And both of them are very valuable and, and give us lessons. This, this place is a great example of that combination. The civic building in the foreground is classical. The private mixed-use buildings in the background are playbills. Anybody know this place? Yeah, it's Santa Fe, which is another tremendous... Uh, character at place in the United States. So learning from these uh, complexities and these tra uh, juxtapositions, we began to look at, learning from Leon, we began to look at, uh, I have to say that because he's probably watching, uh, um, uh, the uh, patterns uh, to, so we can begin to code. So we looked at the urban patterns and the architectural patterns and we started to classify them. Think of the patterns like a, a, a wine and dinner pairing where some combinations of dinner and wine work a lot better than other combinations. So we, we, from this beginning study, we found out there were 16 community character types. And these 16 range from the organic Taos Pueblo to the very formal classical uh, Forbidden City of Beijing. And, and these, are, these typologies are able to help us both understand existing context how did this place end up like this? And to plan for a future context, a future development. How do you, what's missing? What, what could we add to make this place more complex? But we don't need 16 types. We live and work in this context. Southern California, US West, where you have overly wide streets, uh, large or uh, 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 formal thoroughfares that go on and on in perspective so that you don't even see the architecture. The architecture then becomes a, 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 mono, a, a monotonous informal where they're going, er, er, look at me, look at me, because you're going 49 miles an hour by them. Or, or they berm and landscape and say, don't look at me, I'm trying to hide from you. Um, because uh, this, this, this juxtaposition is very boring. It's one of this and one of that. It's not very complex. And we know these people live there and work there. So trying to, uh, and we've already talked about that. My daughter drew this while I was on Charette in LA, so I've always kept it, and I have to put it in there. So how do we do this? How, 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 how do you start to put this into action? The existing redevelopment pattern would take a full block of, the, of private parcels, and they would uh, assemble the property for fair market value, uh, to, uh, uh, clear the site, and then build a new development. And that new development would end up putting pressure pressure on all of the fronts of all the buildings around it, which we know those people that we talked about live, increasing the amount of, of, of contention. And it doesn't even really create a, a center or a place. It's still in perspective. It still uh, could be anywhere uh, in the grid. 
and it only ends up uh, um, uh, making things unstable for the rest of the folks around it. Now consider this, what if you, we take the intersection where you have both and private land, and you create a civic space that's actually um, an organic sort of pattern within this larger formal pattern, and you create the tension of redevelopment with the neighbors mid-block, or the backs of buildings. So there's less conflict between the neighbors to match what was there. You're actually, the, the actual, you're actually able to then talk about transitions from a center type to an edge type. And so I was asked to show, okay, that's fine. Where, where would you find this in the United States? This is, anybody know where this is? This is a Harvard Square in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, around the corner. And, and you can see that it's a very informal pattern with very formal architecture, none of it being civic here. But you see the formal, informal pattern, the, 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 the circular blocks. The buildings form a square, and that's that formal square. And then I'm flying us from Cambridge to San Diego to show you that this is not foreign to us. We can do this. This is part of our American culture, building civic and public places. And we end up in a very typical redevelopment area just outside of downtown. This is uh, Golden Hill. Um, and uh, this place is a little bit different than what we just saw with Harvard Square in the pattern. This is a very formal pattern. This is Broadway. This is 25th Street. And um, you can see that there's 7-Elevens and there's taco shops and pawn shops all set behind, um, all set behind parking areas. The architecture is unseen and unimportant. Uh, there are no civic spaces, there's no plazas, there's no squares, there's no paseos. There is Balboa Park down here about a quarter mile away and a nice new fire station with the flag. Now the idea, that, that, that what's, what else is interesting is that the, the surrounding architecture immediately around that site is actually quite great and eclectic. It's uh, um, uh, uh, an informal uh, modern that uh, Jonathan Siegel and Mike Burnett and, and James Brown have built and uh, it's created a really great precedent. Now, San Diego does have, in the last 30 years, a wonderful architectural vernacular, a language of San Diego. Folks like uh, Rob Quigley, Kevin DeFreitas, uh, Mark Steele, Frank Walden, Ted Smith have put together that we recognize and know as our own. So it's a wonderful background architecture that's, that's been developed here. And this being close to Balboa Park, we have a wonderful civic architecture that I showed you earlier as well to play on. So what ends up happening is you take this uh, commercial node and you turn it into an actual neighborhood center that's a destination. And you create a civic space or a square. Now the informal pattern creates uh, complexity to the formal uh, blocks and grid that you see there. Um, it now has a transit plaza, it now has paseos, it now has a square, um, it has uh, shops, offices, uh, housing. Oh, I keep pointing the wrong way. And this, this increment of development is actually probably the right scale of development for the next 10 years as we get out of this Great Recession. And this is not intended for every uh, intersection. This is intended for neighborhood nodes. And we know where the neighborhoods are. We have community plans. So find those neighborhood and commercial nodes and begin to look at you have a different way of, of, of developing this. Financing, because this isn't a redevelopment property, the city actually has skin in the game. Instead of condemnation, they put in right-of-way from the street, the overly wide streets. They uh, adjust the setbacks that are there, and um, because these are usually at transit plazas, the uh, transit authority has access to state and federal funding. who's trying to promote smart growth anyway. And uh, street improvements are done by the, ci the city's general fund, which is easier to access as well. And when you put land into the game, that helps to leverage financial uh, resources too. So we go from this placelessness that could be anywhere, and you start to create an architecture of this place that combines the informal, uh, uh, eclectic modern that we have, and then a formal, classical uh, foreground that's in the front so it's seen. And the juxtaposition actually starts to create uh, the, the, a recognizable character that you would go and spend time and money. The reason why you spend money there is when, when retail is seen, such as the Macy's at the end of the mall, it gets to 15 to 20 percent more leasing value. When buildings are surrounding a civic space, they actually increase by 10 to 15 percent in value. So just creating this one intervention adds value to it without having to use combination and private property. What this has really done is allowed us to build for our city of villages.
San Diego has talked about a city of villages for 30 years. We have policies in place, we just don't have the tools. We have built this. You know, this is downtown and here's Linda Vista, you know, as far as you can see. And our city of villages idea actually needs new tools to create neighborhoods. And the obvious tools are form-based codes or smart codes that, begin to, that allow you to plan for both the three dimension of architecture and urbanism. Whereas a land use based coding that we have today talks about the quantity, the density, how much residential acreage, how much commercial. So it's a change that we have to embrace that's currently illegal. You also have to look at the way that we talk to the public and, and conduct a meaningful dialogue with them. Currently, if you propose a project, the city says you have to fully develop your concepts, your schemes, your plans, pay your architects, pay your consultants, get it all done, and then we bring it to the Anything that the public says against that great expensive plan, it actually puts them at conflict with the developer. We should be able to plan these, the, the, the character of a place up front. We're currently doing community plan updates, but we're kind of, somehow we're afraid of the community character uh, uh, dialogue. And that's because it's very, it's, it's, it's very um, amorphous, and we need to have these sorts of tools to have a craft that dialogue uh, so we can create real character in a place. So understanding how we work with the public is important too. And finally, this place is actually embodied here. This is, anybody know this place? Bilbao. Never heard of it. Frank Geary comes in, builds a wonderful civic building, a great, the Guggenheim Museum, puts it in the context of this place, and now it's a world-class destination where we go to spend a lot of time and a lot of money to just enjoy. Because they built for social and cultural value that equated to tremendous economic value. They go hand in hand with each other. Um, the, the issue is that when you build for, or the point is, is that, or wait a minute, I recommend, I'm saying, build for economic value by going through cultural and social value because it's cultural value that's going to um, connect us, help us trade ideas, help us uh, connect with each other, and that'll help us endure and thrive into the future as a, as a group of citizens, of socially conscious citizens. Um, if you're interested in this talk being expanded or more of our ideas, please use your smartphone to, to do this scan tag, and you'll find a link to our Placemakers blog, and I appreciate you all being here. Thank you.